So now we're going to change gear a little bit. And uh, I had the privilege and pleasure of uh, chairing a, a working party and roadmap for Arthritis Research UK over the last two years on pain and looking at new ways of managing pain. And they're just about to launch a new initiative in this area, which is very exciting. But one of the things that came out of all of that was how important fatigue was and pain and how interlinked they were. And at the Royal Society meeting last year in Chichley Manor, um, that also came through, that pain and fatigue, not necessarily the post-exertional fatigue, but the fatigue that we associate with many other diseases, uh, was a very important overlap between those. And, and the biology may have some relevance. So you're going to talk about genetics and uh, potentially, anyway, inheritable factors probably in pain. So thank you very, very much for, for coming, uh, Francis. Uh, Francis Williams from King's College in London. Thank you very much for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, this is this is a, a switch really uh, away from uh, the clinical population. Although I work with patients, I'm a rheumatologist, so I see uh, fatiguing illnesses in action. Uh, but I'm not an ME clinician, um, and this is a switch away from the clinic uh, towards the use of a population sample um, called Twins UK which we've um, been running at King's College London for about 25 years, and I've been there for about 15 of them. So um, what I'll talk about is a, bit, a little bit about the mechanism of twinning, just to give you a reminder how that actually happens. I'll tell you about the resource that is Twins UK, uh, and something of the genetic studies around chronic pain, which is my main focus of interest. Uh, I'll then tell you a little bit about QST, which is quantitative sensory testing, which we've used to try and get objective measures of pain sensitivity in people. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, talk about the chronic pain syndromes and psychological factors. So overall, one in 50 Europeans is a twin, with roughly one, four per thousand births being monozygotic or identical twins, with no clear effect of age or race. Dizygotic twin rates, however, vary markedly, uh, between uh, two per thousand in Asians, uh, and up to 15 per thousand in black Africans. And as I'm sure you're aware, dizygotic twinning rates increase markedly with age, such that by the time a woman reaches 37, uh, she has a fourfold increased risk of um, having DZ twins. And of course, the rates have increased recently uh, in the UK owing to the use of infertility treatment, which promotes uh, multiple ovulation. So what happens then in utero as I'm sure you're aware, is that with identical twins, you have a single egg fertilized by a single sperm, and early in the four or eight cells blastocyst stage, they split into two uh, identical uh, offspring which develop in uterus alongside one another. So they're 100% matched for genetic material, and fair, in most cases, fairly closely matched for their environment, although they can have slightly different circulatory experiences in utero. Uh, in contrast, uh, dizygotic or fraternal twins, as the American calls them, uh, are two eggs uh, uh, fertilized at the same time by two separate sperm. They develop alongside each other. So from a genetic perspective, they're as similar as um, siblings, uh, but they, of course, are in utero at the same time and share a similar in utero environment. So those are the main mechanisms of twins, and it's this comparison between the 100% identical and the 50% genetically identical um, uh, uh, material on a background of very similar shared environments, at least initially, that allows you to do studies uh, that are really not possible um, in, in other designs. So Twins UK then was founded 26 years ago uh, with um, small grants from Arthritis Research UK and from the Wellcome Trust. Um, to uh, Tim Spector and Alex McGregor, who had an interest in osteoporosis and osteoarthritis. And because they're also rheumatologists, they have a long-standing interest in joint pain and chronic widespread pain, and over the years have collected information about these conditions, as well as some of the somatic pain syndromes, like chronic pelvic pain, irritable bowel syndrome, and migraine. And my particular interest has been back pain and intervertebral disc degeneration. 
And so just to um, go over again what I've just said about the twin relationship, the, the power of the twin study uh, is, comes from the matching so that in a, a pair that are identical, the A or additive genetic component uh, is matched 100%, and in dizygotic twins, it's matched 50%. And then you have a contribution from C, which is the common environment, uh, correlated one in twins, and E is the unique environment that each twin experiences outside of the twin relationship. So this uh, uh, variance decomposition pattern allows you, I'm sure you'll appreciate, to be able to design many different study designs. You can perform univariate or multivariate analysis when you can consider a single trait or multiple traits simultaneously. So we can begin to ask questions about whether you see, for example, uh, depression along with uh, pain, uh, whether they are sharing a genetic basis or an environmental basis. And similarly, you can perform cotin case studies when you can collect uh, an affected twin with an unaffected twin for whatever disease you like. I'm working currently on rheumatoid. And if they have the same genetic background, you can therefore begin to ask questions about the environment that might have led to that condition, or, for example, as I'm working on, the microbiome. And ultimately, uh, what we're interested in uh, understanding, or part of what we're interested in understanding, is how these uh, shared genetic mechanisms lead us to variation in DNA, DNA, which might then lead to pathways of interest in pathologies. So what the twins is very useful for is exploring this common disease, common variant hypothesis, which is that, uh, for example, in chronic widespread pain, we believe that there are many genes of influence as well as many environmental and lifestyle factors. And because there are many genetic influences, it follows that each gene variant contributes a very small amount to disease risk. And also it follows, as depicted here, that those genetic variants that are important may also be present in the unaffected population. And examples of common complex traits is the stuff that affects us all. Hypertension, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, back pain. And we've got one of the most well phenotyped and omityped collections uh, in the UK that allows us to explore these conditions. So to say something a little bit about pain, of course, pain's a very subjective sensation. And we know that it's influenced by gender and ethnicity and by upbringing and the family environment and what people perceive to be the meaning of pain or what the messaging is telling you about uh, avoiding that condition or, or, or worrying about an underlying diagnosis. We know that chronic pain is seen on a background of increased prevalence of anxiety and depression. And of course, for many rheumatic diseases, the symptom of pain is confounded by the underlying condition. So we all have seen patients that have enormously swollen rheumatoid joints, but who are working full time, raising a family and caring for mum who's 90, without seemingly any pain at all. Well, you can contrast that with a patient who may have a single, very small, uh, barely swollen joint, who complains bitterly of pain all over. So, along with many other groups, we have sought to identify and use objective measures of pain sensitivity that take you away from disease process uh, that might cause pain uh, and provide an objective measure of how sensitive somebody is to pain. And clearly these measures need to be able to be quantified, they need to be reproducible within an individual, and they need to be relevant. So um, we set up, this is Iron who works with our group and some volunteer twins here from a recent party. We set up quantitative sensory testing to obtain such measure of um, pain sensitivity. And Iron here is wearing a heat probe on her forearm and is holding a stop button. And we um, put this on the twins, uh, applied a standard peripheral stimulus, uh, and you can test all sorts of different heat modality, uh, pain modalities, be it heat or mechanical or von Frey or acid. And the twins are enormously generous with their time and with their tissues, and uh, two and a half thousand of them uh, came up to London to undergo this battery of pain-inflicting tests. And I should point out that the pain 
that the, the heat pain does cut out at 50 degrees so they don't get burnt. <laughs> that's, the, that's the theory. Um, and we know that actually this is a useful approach because these pain modalities are heritable. So we know that there is some genetic um, mechanism that is leading to um, uh, the identical twins being more alike in their heat pain sensitivity than the non-identical twins. And this work was uh, funded by Pfizer um, on the basis that genome-wide association scans, which have been going since 2007, have not been terribly successful at finding uh, variants for chronic widespread pain. And they wanted to uh, investigate whether using this approach would allow them to uh, identify a rare variant, rare genetic variant, particularly in those either sensitive or resistant to heat pain that um, would lead them to a, a pathway that they could then target with a, with a, uh, a molecule. So um, although the twins are, are very uh, special because of their DNA relationship, this actually isn't a twin study. This is using them as a population sample. So these are just like volunteers off the, off the street, if you like, uh, because clearly to do exome sequencing on identical twins is not particularly useful. We know what it's going to show. So we, dis we extracted 200 singletons from our database uh, at the extreme of heat pain testing. And you can see it's truncated at 50 degrees where the, the really resilient ones have failed to stop the heat rising. And we sent their blood to the Beijing Genomics Institute for 70x exome sequencing and um, performed a study of rare variants, uh, which is a, a complex statistical uh, uh, study that was quite new at the time and we compared a lot of methods which I won't go into. But we did use ex scrupulous experimental design with the twins because it's very easy to influence this test and what we found when we started was that uh, if you do one twin and then the other the second twin always has a higher reading because they're very competitive and so we had to separate them, put them in different rooms and do them blinded and so the co-twins had to be absent. And the first interesting thing we noticed was the distribution of rare variants. You'll notice that the insensitive bars, the red bars here, show a, an enrichment for rare variants up here uh, that the sensitive folk do not see, do not demonstrate. They have uh, just one or two variants on average. And so this was an unexpected finding that's perhaps telling us something about the evolutionary pressure on uh, variants that make you pain resistant or pain sensitive. And then this is the bit that Pfizer were interested in. This is the single genes, um, the single variants. Uh, uh, because you're doing multiple tests, you have to have a very stringent P threshold here. And one uh, uh, variant in the gene Granzyme M um, surpassed the Bonferroni testing for 14,000 genes. And at the time, it was considered not a particularly interesting hit, um, but there is increasing work uh, demonstrating the role of the immune system in pain, and so it may yet be revisited. I hope so. But what we realize when you do these sorts of studies is that there's a vast amount of information that's not uh, exome-wide significant, uh, but may nevertheless be telling you about pathways. And this comes back to the presentation we had earlier, the big data search. And we use the same causal reasoning pathway uh, as was presented to uh, direct molecular interactions and work upstream from the genes to try and identify the regulators which are given in blue. And the, the presumed loss of function is, is down regulation uh, with gain of function being up regulation. And what we found from this piece of analysis um, was a very highly significant association uh, with the angiotensin uh, two receptor, uh, which is interesting because uh, this was a, a, a target already in clinical trial. There was a monoclonal antibody against the uh, AT2 receptor. So this was a proof of principle uh, study, really, that demonstrated it to be useful, but hasn't actually, um, unfortunately, contributed anything novel to the field. So I'd like to move on to the chronic pain syndromes now and tell you a little bit about, uh, firstly, the dry eye disease. We have an ophthalmologist working with Twins UK, and he was very aware that they see a lot of uh, middle-aged women complaining of dry and gritty eyes who have a normal Shermer's test and who, on ophthalmological examination, appear to have a normal uh, tear film. And we wondered whether this was actually 
a, a possible uh, chronic pain syndrome, like a chronic um, widespread pain. Uh, this would be consistent because the cornea is richly innervated uh, with peripheral nerves. And we could use uh, the uh, heat pain sensitivity testing that we've done with Pfizer to look to see whether there was a, a pattern of sensitivity that was seen in folk who uh, had a diagnosis of dry eye disease, either by, made by a clinician or the prescription of artificial tears or symptoms lasting for three months. And we had 1,600 uh, with questionnaires, uh, a broad range with an age range with a median age of 60. Dre prevalence of dry eyes was similar to that reported by other groups at roughly a quarter. And even after adjusting for age and menopausal status, we found an independent association with heat pain sensitivity. So these folk down here who are cutting off heat pain early because they find it unpleasant are the same folk that are complaining of eye symptoms. So we then went on to wonder whether the, actually these other chronic pain syndromes that we'd collected information on, like irritable bowel and chronic widespread pain, might share predisposing factors. And Twins UK is a really good uh, sample with which to study this uh, because we know from previous work that they represent the general population. Uh, so the results are generalizable to singletons. We're not just interested in treating twins. Um, they've been highly phenotyped with questions that are hidden in great big questionnaires that they're sent every year. So we don't send them a questionnaire that says, this is a pain questionnaire. Are you sensitive to this or do you take that? They get asked about everything. They get urological diagnoses. They get bones and fractures. They get all our rheumatic things. And then you dot the other questions that you're interested in in amongst those. So the hypothesis is never particularly clear. They're just very used to shelling out all their medical information. <coughs> And so what we were thinking was possibly that, that uh, migraine, uh, Rome 3 criteria, IBS, because this is a slightly old study, pelvic pain, dry eyes, and chronic widespread pain might form this chronic pain syndrome, as we called it. We had data on over 8,500 twins. 87% were female for historic reasons with a mean age of 55. So very pertinent to the sort of symptoms that we're studying. And I'm sorry if this doesn't project very well, but what the message is here from this table is that if you look at all the pairings with migraine, you'll see that there is no significant phenotypic correlation with migraine and the other chronic pain syndromes. So this really drops out. This is the, probably the wrong headache phenotype to study. We should have been looking at uh, chronic daily headache. But there is a phenotypic correlation that's significant between every other pairing, so between chronic widespread pain and pelvic pain and so on all the way through. And because they're twins, you can estimate the heritabilities. And the heritabilities were very consistent with other studies, both from within the department, which is reassuring, but also from other groups. So migraine is pretty heritable at 43%. Chronic widespread pain is less so. Uh, pelvic pain is also quite markedly uh, uh, heritable. Irritable bowel syndrome. Is, is, has been a, a, an area of contention. By Rome 2 criteria, we were not finding a heritability. Rome 3 shows a small heritability. This is the first report of the heritability of dry eye symptoms. So they're heritable. And then what you can do is, is a, a, a structural component modeling, looking at the uh, relationships between and among the twins to try and explain or come up with a model which best explains the observed variances between the patterns of phenotypes. And uh, what this showed us was that the best fitting model was something called a common pathway model, which just has A and E in it. So that's additive genetic and unique environmental factors. And it looks like that. So what it suggests is that there's a single sort of predisposing factor that then loads on these four other traits because migraine dropped out. And to our surprise, this chronic pain predisposition is 66% heritable. So really quite striking. We're also interested in asking about neuropathic pain. So this is uh, uh, also available in Twins UK. Uh, we were looking on the background of patients who had been, uh, twins who had been uh, diagnosed on paper as having uh, chronic widespread pain uh, or fibromyalgia syndrome. Um, and uh, we had used the pain detect questionnaire to detect symptoms of 
neuropathic pain. And neuropathic pain is diagnosed as, as a, or reported as a disease or injury to somatosensory nervous system. And in this study, we had uh, over 4,000 twins with a prevalence of chronic widespread pain. Uh, that's pain left and right side of the body, above and below the diaphragm, lasting at least three months, of around 15%. And of those, 16%, sorry, had neuropathic symptoms. So we examined the risk factors for both types of pain, so the, the neuropathic and non-neuropathic pain on the background of chronic widespread pain. And the risk factors were similar, so increasing age, increasing uh, BMI. We also could examine the heritability of neuropathic pain and found it to be 37%. That's one of the first reports of it, of it being heritable. And somewhat to our surprise, because they're meant to have different pathological processes, we found that chronic widespread pain and neuropathic pain shared uh, genetic features. We've also done some work in collaboration with uh, Andrew Burry, who was a psychologist in the department, looking at psychological risk factors for chronic widespread pain. And this also included fatigue that was captured by questionnaire. We were using a, a metabolite that um, has been uh, identified within the department as a strongly associated on agnostic metabolomic screening uh, as associated with chronic widespread pain. And we were interested in, in, in finding out the relationship between uh, the hormone and these different uh, features. And this is a so-called Koleski model. Again, it's the same principle of, uh, of modeling to explain the observed variances between the traits, which shows that there's really quite a number of genetic factors loading on these different features. So they share genetic factors uh, whilst having um, less contribution, really, from the unique environment. And the C, or c common shared environment, can be dropped out of the model altogether. She's also looked at um, some of the psychological risk factors for chronic widespread pain, in particular pain catastrophizing, anxiety sensitivity, and neuroticism. And this table down here just shows the genetic correlation. So this isn't phenotypic, this is the genetic correlation between these important contributors to uh, the, the chronic widespread pain overlap syndrome. And what you can see here is the pain catastrophizing has a very, very high genetic correlation with anxiety sensitivity. So it may suggest here that the sort of psychological constructs that we deal with um, are very similar biological entities with very similar uh, underlying genetic predispositions. So I did have an extra slide to show uh, some of the metabolomic work that we've done in fatigue, but unfortunately I've loaded the wrong slide set on. Uh, but I'm happy to share it afterwards. Uh, so um, I'll just summarize by saying that we've shown that neuropathic pain on the background of chronic widespread pain is heritable. Um, it shares uh, genetic factors with non-neuropathic pain. We uh, consider that the, the chronic pain syndromes that we've examined so not including migraine, but the other traits uh, have a genetic predisposition with a high heritability at 66%. And this means that it's, it's rational to look for genes that are underlying these conditions and you can put them all together because you'll probably get very similar results and you will boost your sample size. And when you're doing these sorts of genetic studies, sample size is everything. We've also shown a shared genetic predisposition between uh, fatigue and anxiety and depression. And I'll end by saying that the twin, uh, Twins UK is a national bioresource funded by NIHR and the Wellcome Trust. And so if you're interested in looking at the data or collaborating, um, please get in touch and I can help you to apply for the data. Thank you very much. Sure.